Welcome, guys. Hello. Hey. Hello. Hi. So we're here to talk about juvenile justice reform. Um, judge Trosh, I want to start with you. You've been kind of a district judge for nearly uh, two decades. What have you seen change about juvenile justice in that time? Um, first, I lost all my hair. Um, <laughs> but no, I, I've seen a, a, a real progression um, in this community uh, of systems working together. So Chief Putney was just out here. Um, and the police department, when I first started, we didn't work a lot with the police department. Since that time under Chief Monroe and now Chief Putney's leadership, uh, we partner with them. They have a diversion program to try and keep juveniles uh, out of the juvenile court system. Uh, they uh, educate all their officers on implicit bias. We have similar partnerships with the school system, the Department of Social Services, and working together, I think we now own uh, the reality that there's a lot of disproportionality. That hasn't changed over the 20 years that I've been a judge. The people that come in front of me, the children, the, the juveniles, are uh, children of color for the most part. That has not changed. What has changed is our recognition in the role that we play as institutions um, and what we can do together to try and uh, change those numbers. Ricky, you work a lot with the youth there in your uh, youth justice project. Can you talk to me about kind of your experiences working with them and what you've learned about the, the disparities that Judge Trosh mentioned? So Judge Trosh is absolutely correct. The disparities that exist in the court systems are, are clear. Um, I worked for, first as a public defender in Guilford County, and I worked directly with youth who were being uh, referred to court, and overwhelmingly they were black uh, minority students. Um, in my work with the Youth Justice Project and in the campaign to push for raising that age, um, did a lot of community education around trying to just educate folks about the juvenile system, the adult system, and the differences between the two and the benefits of um, treating and having youth in the juvenile system rather than the adult system if you're going to have them in any system at all. Um, a lot of education not only of young people but also adults, um, folks who weren't really familiar with the systems that we're talking about and that we're working in. Um, really trying to explain to folks that um, the, the real difference in the juvenile system and the adult system is that there's more rehabilitation um, and that's where we'd rather see our youth. Absolutely. Eric, North Carolina recently passed a raise the age bill, meaning that they'll no longer prosecute 16 and 17 year olds as adults automatically. Um, it was the last state in the country to kind of pass a bill of that measure. Why do you think it took so long? Um, well, it's been the law for almost 100 years. And it's just as problematic to figure out why we had the law in the first place to go back and fix it. Um, but I think that the work that local advocates have done, um, the information, the education on adolescent brain development, U.S. Supreme Court cases, there was a lot of things coming together at the same time. And I think one thing that's important to discuss is it was never really a partisan issue. It was always sort of a bipartisan um, push to get this done. And um, the culmination really was um, the Chief Justice's uh, Commission on the Administration of Law and Justice in their report, uh, making the recommendations, and again, sort of building the case based on uh, adolescent development, that kids are different, and um, you know, making the case that way. Ricky, Judge, Judge Trash, do you? Absolutely. Um, I think that the Judges Committee did a great job of really being evidence-based and rooted in science, um, you know, things that actually really matter, um, that, that prove that uh, brain development doesn't really finish until people are in their mid-20s. Um, I think that those types of examples of reasons why we need to be developmentally uh, minded and focused in how we approach uh, handling misbehavior or criminal activity um, is key, it was, and was key to seeing Raise the Age pass and become successful. Um, the, the devil is really going to be in the details of implementation and how we move forward in making sure that it's actually carried out in a way that's effective and meaningful for as many kids as possible. And if I could address that, I think that is a, a critical issue. So the law goes into effect in uh, 2019, December of 2019, which means we've got about two years to get ready. Um, I know the state and built into the law is a commission that's going to be looking on it. I think, Eric, you're sitting on that commission um, at, and, and Rick, I don't know, I think you might be on I'm not on it. You're not we, on it. We are you should waiting. be on it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, at well, any rate, <laughs> they're going to be looking at what do you do the devil, what is the devil in the details? Uh, we didn't wait for that commission to get started here. We partnered with the county and the county was really, uh, has exercised a lot of leadership to pull a committee together here in Mecklenburg County to look at our numbers. 
which are frankly a lot different than what the state is predicting, and to figure out what are we going to do about detention facilities? What are we going to do about transportation? What are we going to do about court, um, uh, court resources? Uh, so it's a great idea philosophically. Uh, it needed to happen. It was many, many, many decades. Uh, it should have happened long ago. But we do need the community support in figuring out how do we now implement this law because it will uh, cause great changes in both the adult criminal justice system and the juvenile justice system. Okay. Rick, I was going to say, talk about how the, the importance of including youth voices in, in kind of the transition between now and 2019. So I think it's critical, and just to go back to one point, um, representatives uh, Moore and Berger are the ones who will be appointing or selecting those two community advocates for young people. Um, they don't want me on the committee. Um, hopefully <laughs> they will appoint people who have worked with us and done this work and made sure that they were advocating for all children. Um, but I think that in terms of having a, a young person's voice or young people's voices um, involved, it's critical. Um, but it's hard to do. Um, you've got to think about the sensitivity of being in juvenile court in the first place, right? The whole benefit, one of the benefits of being in juvenile court is that your record is protected, right? Um, in very rare circumstances, it can be open, but it's typically such that nobody's going to know that you were necessarily in a juvenile court. Um, so to find people to say, oh, well, talk to us about the benefits of why you're happy that you were able to be in juvenile court as opposed to being, you know, thrown into the adult system, sometimes that was really hard to do. Um, or oftentimes it was really hard to do. So what we were able to do was find folks who have been directly impacted and harmed by being involved in the adult system and how just because they were 16 and a half or 16 in one day, um, they were thrown into the adult system, whereas their peers who might have been you know, 15 and 364 days old were in the juvenile system. And that's how arbitrary the law was. Um, those are the types of instances that really show you know, people that are still trying to get back on track that have just come out of you know, being in, in jail, you know, and they're still, or in prison, and they're still trying to figure out how to get, get out of it. But that's the cycle that happens when you're thrown into really any system, but especially the adult prison system. Um, those are the types of things that we're really trying to get out there so that people can understand and that they can remember um, that we're not done. Like, yes, we've raised the age on paper, but it hasn't taken effect yet. It's going to be two years, and there are a lot of kids that are going to fall through that gap <laughs> of about two years um, where they're not going to receive the benefits of being in a juvenile court. Absolutely. Eric? Well, I, I agree with all that. Um, there's, a, there's a lot to be done. Um, as Judge Trosh mentioned, you know, Charlotte's looking into this. Just last Friday, I was in Kinston, North Carolina, and that gathered together not only court personnel, but mental health personnel and law enforcement, uh, school officials, um, guardians ad litem. Uh, there's a lot of folks who are concerned about how to move forward, but I think both on the state you know, wide level, but also on the community level, people are having these conversations. We're trying to encourage them because, you know, we have 100 counties in the state. Each county runs differently, and you got to know how it's going to impact you specifically. So, you know, I'm glad to hear that's happening, and we're trying to help facilitate when we can. Absolutely. You mentioned earlier that this is a, kind of a bipartisan effort, um, but Judge Trosh, you recently, after being a lifelong Republican, <laughs> um, have now become a Democrat. How has that changed? <laughs> Give me some love. <laughs> At least you're getting some love. <laughs> how has that changed how you view the, the bill and, and how partisanship affects the courts? I don't think it, it changed. First of all, I don't think partisanship should uh, affect the bench at all. I think the, the bench is sh and should be an independent uh, branch of government. I think that's under assault across the country. Um, that's in large part why I changed uh, parties, because I just I couldn't, um, that and many other reasons, but I couldn't be a part of a party that was trying to dismantle the institution that I have, uh, have chosen as my career. Um, so, uh, but the, the issue itself of raise the age, I don't think it should matter whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. Um, it was the right thing to do for kids and it was the right thing to do for this state. So I, I would agree with, with uh, both uh, uh, my colleagues' comments that uh, it really was across the aisle. I think everybody realized that it was the right thing to do whether they were Republicans or Democrats. The devil, though, is in the details. Um, and again, we've got two years to plan for what's going to happen. Absolutely. I want to transition a little bit to talking about schools. Schools play a major role in referring you know, students into the juvenile justice system. What do you think that Raise the Age, what effect do you think Raise the Age will have on, on schools and the school to prison pipeline as we know it? So first of all, um, we have an initiative here called Race Matters for Juvenile Justice. 
uh, which is an initiative specifically that looks at what do institutions, all the institutions that I mentioned earlier that touch the lives of children, what do we do to exasper exacerbate or worsen disproportionality and disparities for children of color? And so there's a lot of work that's done. I'm going to give a plug October 30th. There is a conference, our second biannual conference, community conference. Go on the RMJJ website. It's at Crown Plaza. Um, there are many people I, I can kind of see out there that are from RMJJ. Ask somebody about it, but that's something to get involved in. Um, but to your question, as an outgrowth of that, we then learned of uh, efforts across the country for schools to partner with law enforcement, to partner with the court system, to partner with juvenile probation to try and keep cases out of the court system. Because in the 1990s, under, with, with the zero tolerance policies, we began to get two kids get into a fight. When I was in school, we got paddled. Maybe when you were in school, you got suspended. Um, but now, in the 90, late 90s, they were coming to the court system. And so we partnered with the school system. Um, and they've changed their disciplinary policies, and we have, the, we have uh, classes of offenses that just don't come to juvenile court. I think that raise the age is go going to um, up the ante for that for kids that are 16 and 17 uh, years old as well. So hopefully things that need to be dealt with in the schools will be dealt with in the schools instead of people that are wearing black dresses. Ricky, I see you nodding your head a bunch. Yeah, I agree with what Judge just said. Um, I, I think a key part of the new legislation is the school justice partnerships component that kind of will, will require that school systems figure out how to address behaviors that should be handled and addressed either in schools or outside of court, but through other means that are, that are productive and meaningful for folks and that kind of educate folks as opposed to just like, hey, let's, let's punish you. Um, I think that once we figure out how to divert folks from court into other places that are going to be positive and um, productive for them, we'll, we'll be a lot better off. Um, and I think that we've got to also get some better training for um, school resource officers. If we're going to have them in schools, we've got to figure out how to educate them so that they know that they shouldn't be the first line of defense in terms of addressing or handling problems that occur in schools. I see you. <laughs> well, I, w one thing to know is um, <clears throat> even though the, the number of complaints um, coming into North Carolina courts have dropped pretty precipitously, if I said that correctly, um, the rate of kids coming from school has remained the same. It's like between 40 and 42 percent for the last 10 or 12 years, and it's, it's really a tough nut to crack. Um, school justice partnership is going to be a great piece to that. I also think it's really, really important to educate the school resource officers and other law enforcement, specifically on adolescent development and implicit bias. Um, I know historically the number of hours that you need to take um, to satisfy basic law enforcement accreditation has been very small, um, but the bill puts that in there and we really need to focus on that, hopefully in partnership um, with the Attorney General's office and the law enforcement community. Absolutely. Um, we mentioned racial disparities a bunch um, throughout our time together. Uh, and I want to talk about how that, that impacts North Carolina specifically, um, given that this law um, deals specifically only with misdemeanors and nonviolent felonies. How do we think that this law will affect the types of racial disparities that happen given that it excludes violent felonies? Well, I think the fact of the matter is, is that when you're dealing with young people and youth, I mean, the majority of the offenses that you're going to see across the board, about 80% of them are going to be nonviolent misdemeanors and some of the lower level felonies. Um, essentially, what, what you've got to do is figure out how to, to get rid of the, those subjective offenses that you see when people are in classes and in schools. Um, the offenses that, you know, disrespect or uh, talking back, uh, things that, you know, maybe can be overlooked or treated in a different way. Um, once we start seeing some of those types of crimes not sent to court but addressed in other ways, I think we'll be a lot better off. Judge Josh? Well, there was a study in Texas called Breaking School Rules that addressed exactly what you're talking about, which basically found that they studied 100,000 kids in the school system, and this was about disciplinary actions in the school system, but it relates to which cases get sent to court uh, as well. So they studied 100,000 kids, and they studied uh, w what their actions were, and because they had such a large number of children that they were following on a longitudinal basis, they were able to control for, I think it's 80, 80 factors. 
How many? Should, I've got our professor from the UNC. 83 factors. I'm sorry, not 80, 83 factors. So basically, they could compare almost identical children and what happened when they engaged in behaviors like talking back to a teacher or getting into a fight with another student. And literally, you could have a student, a, a white student, and a black student in the same school coming from literally almost the exact same background that lived next door to each other, engaged saying the exact same thing to their teacher and the response was entirely different, whereas the white student might get a note sent home to the parent, the African American student was much more likely to be suspended from school and or reported to the court system. So those are the kind of discretionary offenses that um, we're trying to deal with in our uh, school uh, partnership uh, partnerships um, as well as in RMJJ because that's that's where you see um, disparities that just shouldn't be there. Absolutely. We mentioned that we have two years before this bill fully takes into effect, 2019. Um, and we talked so much about how the devil is in the details and how there's going to be a lot of things that have to be kind of implemented in the meantime. What does this bill not take care of? What are, what are some issues facing this community that are not going to be swept up in this? Um, we've got a report that we're actually going to be releasing pretty soon that kind of addresses some of the issues with the juvenile system as a whole. But I mean, uh, overall, I think we need to improve our juvenile system. We need to strengthen it so that it's prepared to handle um, and address issues that occur in juvenile court. Um, one thing that I'll, that I'll throw out there is the fact that we have, of the states that actually have um, lower threshold uh, ages for juvenile jurisdiction, you can be six years old in North Carolina and go to juvenile court. And we think that's way too low. Um, so yep. we think you should start there, raising that, that uh, minimum juvenile age to, I don't know, maybe 10, 10. 11 um, <laughs> would, be, would be a great start. Absolutely. Eric. Well, there's, there's a whole host of things. And I, I think folks know that you know, when we worked on the bill initially, we were just trying to get a package together that we knew would be successful. But we also knew there were going to be issues and holes. There's some things that are somewhat contradictory. Um, you know, we mentioned this, the new mandatory waiver process. And we need to figure out ways where kids can be addressed individually. One of the things we have going for us now is judges are able to use their discretion to determine when kids should be transferred. I think that discretion needs to be reviewed again, not only going up, but maybe coming back down. We don't have a reverse waiver prov provision because information later on can come out and the state may decide, you know what, maybe this should have been in juvenile court in the first place, so we have to address that as well. Judge yeah, let me give you let me uh, give you an example to to uh, sort of further explain what Eric's talking about. If a juvenile comes in and under the current provision, the district attorney's office and the court system has to make a very quick decision as to what to charge the juvenile with, and whether or not there's probable cause for that case to move forward. What frequently happens is when district attorneys have limited information, they charge the highest level of offense possible. Well, because we have an automatic waiver provision for A through G felonies, many cases that would end up being pled down to a low-level felony or even a misdemeanor under the way the, the law is written now will stay in adult court. So a juvenile might be charged, steal a phone, you know, I threaten to hit you and you give me your phone, you're charged with common law robbery. Right now that's an automatic transfer once a judge finds probable cause or there's an indictment. But there's no provision when the district attorneys look at the case and they're like, wait a minute, this is really more of a misdemeanor larceny case. This is not a class G felony or a class E felony or whatever they're charged with. Right now, even though the case would then be uh, reduced to a misdemeanor larceny, it stays in the adult system. And I don't think that's what the framers of the legislation want. So I'm hopeful that they'll come up with a provision that a superior court judge or the district attorney's office can then send the case back to juvenile court if it's pled down to a lesser offense. Absolutely. And in closing, what do you think there, what are the lessons that, that other states can learn from the challenges that you've seen trying to put this bill together or, or generally working on reform in juvenile justice? Well, you know, <clears throat> for me, it was a breeze. It was only 12 years of work. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, I was talking to somebody recently in a state so there's some states that still have the, ma the maximum age at 17. Um, and I was talking to somebody from there and, you know, it is a marathon and you have to think about this in stages and what's going to be, you know, an effective pitch. And again, I think we just, there was so much information, you know, the Chief Justice's study was actually the fifth 
study that recommended raise the age since 2007. So, you know, once you say things five times, you know, maybe it'll, maybe it'll come through. And sometimes you just have to be patient and consistent and forthright about it. Absolutely. Ricky? I think those are words to live by even when you're handling and addressing kids too, right? Like right. sometimes they might take the third, fourth, fifth time. Um, I think that, yeah, I don't have kids, but I, that's what I hear. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I feel like we, we really have an opportunity to, to keep the momentum going of after Raise the Age. I, I think that we need to really make sure that we don't forget about those huge, large, you know, racial and gender uh, disparities that exist in the systems that we have and figure out how to address those first, because I think we'll continue to have a lot of issues until we figure out how to address those problems. Um, if you're black, if you're male, and if you have a disability, um, you're more likely to be involved in the juvenile system or the criminal system. And I think that those are big picture issues that we need to continue to remember and keep our eye on as we raise the age. Because again, um, disparities have gotten worse as we've, as we've progressed over the last 10, 15 years. Um, yeah, maybe we have fewer youth in the system, um, but the disparities are getting worse. So we need to really figure out how to address the disparities, and I think then we'll really have some, some real uh, solutions. Judge Trash, and then we have a second for questions. So to, to, the, uh, to, to that, I think that the key is the length of time. You can't come to one forum one day and have everything change and everybody sing Kumbaya. Um, I, back in the year 2000, Community Building Initiative led the judges through a process called Judicial Leadership in a Diverse Community. We didn't know where that was going to go, but we are now 17 years later and initiatives like Race Matters for Juvenile Justice or the Pathways uh, project or uh, what's going on with the safety and justice challenge have resulted from us sitting around tables, heads of agencies and institutions and community activists and community members and talked about the problems in a real and honest way. And when you do that, you may not get the solution the first year or the second year, you probably won't. But after 10 or 15 years, you reach a tipping point. And I think this community has reached a tipping point. At least I hope that we've reached a tipping point um, to where we're going to continue to, to, to make progress um, and not just talk about reduced overall numbers, but start talking about reduced disparities and disproportionalities. Uh, I may not get there with you, but I'm hoping that my kids and my grandkids will see that day. Absolutely. We have a question. All I can say to that is amen. Can, can I, so one brief response, I just heard last Friday, the kids who are in our youth development centers, our youth prisons, there's about 185, 190 at every, any given time, every single one of them was identified with a mental health need, every single one recently. Absolutely. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Bishop Tanya Rawls, and I'm executive director of the Freedom Center for Social Justice. Um, I want to make a note to something that happened in the last session first, um, and that was when a young person asked a question that someone was uncomfortable with, and then it was stated that the question was silly. So when we ha and, and people applauded. So uh, it, what was interesting was before even making the statement, I was asked is it okay or should I say who I'm with before I make my statement? When we ever get to the place where questions that young people ask, and when we're in organizations that young people will be coming forward, if we're really serious about making some of these changes, we also have to be okay with how they say what they say. And I think until we do that, this is all BS, right? So now, that being said, I wanted to say it to him, but he left too soon. So. Um, 
my question is in reference to LGBTQ young people. Um, when we talk about uh, discrepancies and disparities, um, the numbers that you have for black students, you have to up that for LGBTQ students. And it was interesting that I didn't hear that population mentioned and was curious about how, that, how you see that playing out in the system and what kind of things we can do to help improve their experiences. So I'll start to answer your question. Um, I appreciate it as well because it's actually a part of the report that we've got coming out at Youth Justice Project. Um, the, the big problem with LGBTQ um, students is that those types of statistics and metrics aren't really tracked or kept. So it's really hard to account for exactly how, how those students are kind of navigating throughout the school system. So I would say a big solution would be to figure out how to track or monitor um, in some way um, people that identify that way. Yeah, and I, I would say not just for LGBT, uh, LGBT uh, students, but also um, um, across the board, we don't keep, uh, for Hispanic or Latino students, for example, every agency keeps different statistics. So I think across the board, the first thing you have to do in order to reach a resolution or to a better place, get, get to a better place, is to know what your numbers are and know what things look like and we just don't do a good job of that right now. So I would agree wholeheartedly with that. Absolutely. We have our last question. Oh, last question this way. What, um, what are we doing to disrupt the pipeline in the education or preparation of the teachers, which seems to be where the criminal action is happening? It'll prepare uh, individuals working in the educational system that can handle it so they pass it along. So maybe at the, le at the state level, at the university level, is there any conversation happening there from your area with those agencies? So uh, our school system, I, I can speak locally to our school system, Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools has been a partner with us with Race Matters for Juvenile Justice. So they have sent uh, most of their leadership staff and many of their area uh, superintendents and principals to a two-day workshop called race, the uh, Race Equity workshop, workshop. You may have known that as a Dismantling Racism workshop which talks about a lot of these issues and their response to uh, students and their own um, biases that they may not be aware of. So in addition to that, they also uh, partnered with a group called the Winner Group to begin to do exactly some of the things that you talked about, to, have, to better prepare teachers, to uh, uh, change the way that they approach discipline in uh, school by school um, and, and uh, area by area. Uh, within the system. So I know that they are engaged in a lot of efforts, but it's a long road and there are a lot of teachers and it's a, lo it's a long uh, journey, I think, to get to a place where every teacher uh, approaches things from a strength-based perspective as opposed to a get them out of my classroom because you're causing trouble uh, perspective. But we're on that road and, and CMS has been a partner. I also know that at, U at UNCC and some of the other local institutions, they're bringing lessons to their uh, st uh, students who are going to be teachers and social workers about things like implicit bias, which frankly just used to not happen. So they didn't get any training about their own biases or about institutional racism or those types of things at all. And now I think they're getting more training about that. So that, there's hope for the future. I think the answer to your question is probably as diverse and varied as there are uh, public school or educational systems across the state. Um, I think that some are doing a really good job at trying to educate their teachers um, and get them on the right track, but I think that some probably, it's not even on their radar. But what I do know is that teachers need resources to do that. Um, and if you have a legislator that's constantly and consistently gutting and taking away resources to really you know, help teachers to be able to do what they need to do, um, it's going to be a lot harder to, to address. So I think we need to start by making sure that teachers have the resources that they need to be able to do what they need to do. Absolutely. We're going to take one, um, one final. My name is Kendra King, and I'm the Advanced Advocate and Accountability Specialist with Market Your Mind Services. I'm also uh, an advocate and mentor at the only alternative school in Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools, Turning Point Academy. My question is, what is y'all's thoughts or plan to address the school to prison pipeline that exists there? Because for the past two and a half years, I've been doing an assessment on this particular school. There's a lack of resources in regards to mental health, in regards to security, in regards to effective staff, whether it be teachers, administration. Um, there are students there that have charges from rape to murder to aggravated assault. One of my girls that um, 
was exploited, trafficked, and murdered while in DSS custody, and it happened on a school day. Um, what else are y'all gonna do to prevent the commercial sexual exploitation and domestic minor sex trafficking that happens to girls of color here in Mecklenburg County? Because it just seems that there's a bigger focus on African American males and there's a neglect on these girls. So that is my question for this particular panel. <laughs> It's a big question, and, and a lot. Of, there's a lot of things that are uh, that are going on. Uh, we do have a uh, community-wide uh, task force that's looking at uh, human trafficking and what can be done. Our former U.S. Attorney Ann Tompkins was instrumental in getting that uh, that rolling. Um, and so there are a lot of things that are being done in juvenile court. One of the things that we have done is we, frankly, we didn't have protocols for young women or young men, because both young women and young men are uh, unfortunately involved in human trafficking. Uh, we didn't have any protocols. So we didn't know how to identify. It was sort of under the radar. Nobody talked about it. You just, just didn't think about it. And um, so some, some bad things happened. You mentioned one bad thing that happened, but other bad things were happening where in the adult system, uh, young women were being bonded out by their uncles and we found out they weren't their uncles um, and so we've now developed a protocol uh, for not just the court system but for social workers for probation officers for juvenile court counselors to recognize um, signs that uh, that uh, the young person might be involved in human trafficking and then a protocol uh, to deal with what do you do? And, and that's at the beginning stages that we really should be farther along, but um, we're moving in that direction. We've got a lot of work to do in a lot of these areas. Um, we, we simply do. Thank you for that really important question. And thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you.